أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما ذهبوا به وأجمعوا أن يجعله في غيابة الجب وأوحينا إليه لتنبئنهم بأمرهم هذا وهم لا يشعرون وجاءوا أباهم عشاء يبكون قالوا يا أبانا إنا ذهبنا يستبق وتركنا يوسف عند متاعنا فأكله الذئب وما أنت بمؤمن لنا ولو كنا صادقين وجاءوا على قامسيه بذا من كذب قال بل سولت لكم أنفسكم أمرا فصبر جميل والله المستعان على ما تصفون صدق الله العظيم Jazakallah khairan, brother, for that solemn prayer dua. All right, let's do it again, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There are 74 of us tonight in this Zoom session. Although most of you are, um, are all close or are closing their cameras, that's all right. You're not required to turn on your cameras, but you are encouraged so that we could have the feel of each other's presence. So to all 74 of you, welcome to the launching event of the International Students of Islamic Psychology, ISIP Philippine chapter. So prior to going to the main talk by our esteemed speaker, allow me, Tara Iman Alanto, to introduce to you what is the International Students of Islamic Psychology, ISIP. But before that, let's find out who we are tonight, who are here tonight, based on your registration from our Google Forms prior. So here. Right. So, so there are uh, most of our participants, 50% of you are within the 25 to 45 age group. I say we are at the young age group, so I expect some of your energy, inshallah, during the Q&A session later on. May we all benefit from that. And 90% are residing from the Philippines. We're so glad to see that during the waiting time, there are people who send their shout outs, their salams from the different parts of the Philippines. Special salams to the people outside in the Philippines, like Turkey, Netherlands, and Saudi Arabia. And lastly, and most interestingly, most are students and professionals from fields other than psychology or the field of mental health. We are happy about your interest and may you be instruments in spreading Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health awareness, inshallah. So who are we or who is or what is the Islamic International Students of Islamic Psychology? So here is our mission. So the mission of ISIP is to be an inclusive space designed to connect people with a diverse background interested in Islamic psychology, just like what we are doing right here today, tonight, alhamdulillah. 
It also aims to disseminate knowledge, share resources, and discuss best practices in a free, accessible manner. Later on, we'll be sharing links to references and chat groups wherein you can share and get or receive um, resources regarding Islamic psychology. Lastly, our mission is to be a platform that enables further development of people's personal and professional interests, studies, and understanding of Islamic psychology within their communities and or countries of origin. As this is the launching project of ISIP Philippine chapter, the ISAP global chapter or the main chapter has been present since 2020 during the wake of the pandemic. And here is our vision. What does ISIP as an organization want to achieve? ISIP aims to bring about positive well-being for all human beings through a revival and promotion of Islamic psychology. Later on, our esteemed speaker will discuss about Islamic psychology as well. ISIP aims to revive the heritage of our well-rooted Islamic tradition and provide the basis of indigenous Islamic approaches within the realm of psychology, meaning psychology and Islam are not opposites or incongruent to each other, as will be discussed later on. ISIP envisions the normalization of Islamic psychology throughout the world and eliminating stigma addressing mental health issues. There, there is no shame in talking about and expressing our mental health, even if we are Muslims. Lastly, ISIP aspires to facilitate a variety of healing practices and modalities that adhere to the principles of Islamic psychology. So that's it for ISIP. Now here are the important links that you could visit to uh, know more about ISAP to gain more knowledge about Islamic psychology. If you're interested to join, just go to the website of ISIP or contact us to our emails to be a member of ISIP and ISIP Philippine chapter. So now we have discussed what is ISIP. For any questions regarding ISIP, you could input it in the inbox, uh, in the chat box. If you have more questions later on, we will answer them in more detail. But let us now go to the exciting part of our program tonight, which is our main talk. We are very much privileged and blessed to have with us as a speaker and as a fellow facilitator of ISIP Philippine chapter. Our dear speaker, Sister Jane, has been a mental health and psychosocial support specialist for more than 15 years, designing and conducting psychosocial processing sessions for disaster survivors, children orphaned by the Mindanao conflict, political detainees, and families of victims of involuntary disappearances in the Philippines. She is also the co-author of a MHPSS Muslim Filipinos training module and a psychological first aid story book for children. Sister Jane as Teach Peace and Build Peace Movements MHPSS consultant. She conducts peace education, formal information sessions for teachers, students, and parents. She is also a registered member of the International Association of Muslim Psychologists, a certified life, leadership, and management coach. She provides content for the Islamic Mental Health website and Facebook page, and is currently a student herself for Islamic Psychology and Counseling Level 2 from Al-Balagh Academy. 
prior to focusing full-time in community education and MHESS, she was the coordinator for social sciences at the University of Perpetual Health, Dr. Jose G. Riza G. Tamayo Medical University, where she taught for nine years. Alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters, we are privileged to have with us someone whose work and heart has been in Islamic psychology and has been focused on providing MHESS to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Help me warmly welcome Ms. Jane Marie de Makisil Samur, a mental health and psychosocial support specialist for tonight's talk. Yes, hello, Khairan Khatiran, Sis Iman, for the very um, very wonderful beginning of the program introducing ISIP as well as for the introduction. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh to everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm extending the salams of our brothers and sisters here in Turkey to everyone there in the Philippines and other parts of the world like the Netherlands, I see. Okay. So uh, before I officially begin the talk, let's again go back to um, checking our niyat for joining the session. Let's renew it. Let's hope that we will be coming together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gain more of um, knowledge about Islam. No? So bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafiyan wa rizqan tayyiban wa amala mutakabbalan. O Allah, we ask you for knowledge that is of benefit, provision that is good, and deeds that will be accepted. I mean, okay. So the topic that uh, we are going to discuss today is the application of an Islamic perspective in mental health and psychosocial support. Uh, what are we exactly going to be covering? All right. So briefly, I hope I can do this within 40 minutes. So we'll have more time to have, um, you know, the Q&A to entertain your questions or queries. So first, it's just an overview of what Islamic psychology uh, what Islamic psychology is, followed by an overview of mental health and psychosocial support. I know a lot of you are familiar with this term, but for those also who are not yet that familiar, we'll get to know the basics of MHPSS and how it came about. Then third is the application of the Islamic framework when, um, conducting or designing programs that integrate MHPSS. Then fourth, we'll be focusing on the current challenges that we are facing when it comes to implementing an Islamic MHPSS approach. And then fifth, inshallah, we'll be discussing or just um, listing some ways to move forward or to how to advocate more for an Islamic approach to MHPSS. All right, so I hope... Um, we can all um, maintain our connection. Uh, that's a virtual challenge. And uh, please feel free to write your, your queries, your thoughts in the uh, chat box, and we'll get back to that later on. Okay. Bismillah. Okay. So first is Islamic psychology. Now, in recent years, there has been a growth in the interest in Islamic psychology. I, I know there are a lot of you who are students of psychology right now, and you will notice that what predominates in our field would be Western paradigms or Western approaches. However, because of globalization, because of um, constant research into existing literature and because of uh, migration or diaspora of, you know, the, the Muslim community given by different factors, whether it be for, um, you know, in search for a better um, life abroad or because of wars where there are a lot of people displaced, there has been a growing interest in the field of Islamic psychology. However, we also have to admit that when we talk about Islamic psychology, there is also a tendency to automatically think of Islamic psychology as getting terms, uh, Islamic terms or Islamic concepts, and then partnering it or um, appropriating it to certain Western concepts. Okay, so it's like, just getting a Western theory or Western paradigm, and then you feel like, hey, that that's uh, this is the Islamic term for this. This is what we will use. It's happening, and that's different from Islamic psychology. Um, if you go to the 
ISIP website, you will see that this is what we would call Islamization of psychology. However, we have to be very clear that when we talk about Islamic psychology, okay, it is rooted in the Quranic worldview and prophetic example as embodied by our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All right. So basically, um, actually, I'll be discussing this later on when I when I show the framework. But um, as early as now, we have to remember, yes, you might see certain similarities or you might see certain concepts from Western paradigms that you feel are applicable, particularly to the Muslim population. However, we need to remember that when we talk about Islamic psychology, it is rooted in uh, the Quranic worldview the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all right? So um, another thing that's very clear here, most of the, the uh, Western paradigms or the existing psychological paradigms that are being used or applied do not take into consider the um, element of time in, um, in that it is limited to time in dunya or in this world, okay? However, when you talk about Islamic psychology, time here would mean life in this world and the hereafter, all right? So when we talk about uh, human behavior, when we talk about healing, when we talk about um, personal development or personality development, we try to consider not just this world, but also akhira or the hereafter. Okay, so Islamic psychology looks at the human being in a holistic manner, all right? Holistic manner. So when we talk about holistic manner, basically you are integrating, you are considering all aspects of human life. You are applying Islam, okay, uh, the Quranic teachings, the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in all aspects of human life. Uh, let's admit it. I am also trained in, uh, you know, in a non-Islamic psych myself, okay, graduating from a non-Islamic school. Um, you will notice in a secular setting, human life is often, um, what do you call that, um, shown or presented into different compartments. You have the biological, you have the emotional, you have the cognitive or the mental, then you have the social or the social cultural. And then the religion is only um, a sub category or a sub um, topic in the social cultural domain of human life. However, when you talk about Islamic psychology, we're looking at all these domains or all these compartments, if you, if you uh, would like to consider them in a holistic manner. They are all connected to one another. They are all there to serve the purpose of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so you need, we need to look at the human being in a holistic manner. We need to examine, okay, behavior, cognition, emotions, okay? We need to apply healing um, by looking at it through an Islamic lens, okay? And then, of course, it's centered on the concept of fitra, okay? What is fitra? Basically, it is the soul's inclination to what is good. It is the connection of the soul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Everybody was born with that uh, inclination to good or that good connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as we are, you know, exposed to the outside world, um, as we are exposed to the different cultures, traditions, uh, you know, parenting styles and priorities and values of people around us, sometimes our fitra is muted or, you know, weakened. So it's still there, but it's weakened by our lifestyle, by the society to which we are exposed. OK, so the goal of Islamic psychology is to bring the human being back in touch with the fitra for true well-being. All right. So I hope that is clear. Um, this actually, when we talk about Islamic psychology, being a student myself, it can take um, a whole year or more to discuss all the different aspects, the fascinating aspects of it. So this is just an overview of it. Now, let's proceed to the second one. Okay, two out of five. So mental health and psychosocial support. Now, when we talk about mental health and psychosocial support, I will be presenting first the general 
um, explanation, description, or concept of MHPSS that the global humanitarian community is using. However, it would be nice that as I discuss this, um, we can already start reflecting on how is it related to um, the Islamic way of life? Um, why is it relevant? Or how can we apply an Islamic framework to MHPSS? Okay, so when we talk about MHPSS, it actually started uh, as a, what do you call this? As an important component, component of humanitarian response, okay? So when you look at the main document used um, by most of the MHPSS practitioners, okay, by the way, when, if you talk about MHPSS, more often than not, the uh, practitioners are people with a psychology background, okay? and have been experienced in, in different humanitarian response. However, there are also those who are not having a psychology background. Okay, they may be social workers or other um, practitioners in the social sciences field. However, the experience is very important. Okay, now when we look at the interagency standing committee guidelines for MHPSS in emergency settings, this is the main document that we are using for MHPSS. It is uh, defining MHPSS as any type of local or outside support that aims to protect or promote psychosocial well-being and or prevent or treat mental health condition. Okay, so you will see that there are certain terms I am highlighting here. Okay, the, uh, the blue color. Okay, it can be local or outside support. Some questions I'm, I, I would like to pose right now. If you are thinking of MHPSS, uh, which one do you think would be more beneficial? Which one do you think would be more sustainable? Will it be the local support or will it be outside support? Okay. Now, when we look at the aim of MHPSS, it is to protect or promote psychosocial well-being and to prevent or treat mental health condition. So clearly, this is not just about mental illnesses. MHPSS is also about promoting uh, well-being, health and wellness of an individual and of a community. Okay, so uh, just for the overview, let's look at the core principles of MHPSS. And again, it would be a nice uh, practice for us to again relate it to what we are um, instructed to uphold in Islam, all right? So the core principles of MHPSS, which is basically the basis of the key actions of MHPSS, would be first, human rights and equity. Especially when we talk about emergency response or humanitarian response, we need to ensure that our programs are upholding the rights of everyone, okay? It has to be everyone. We need to be impartial. We need to uh, be very critical about our programming. We have to ensure that we are not discriminating or disregarding certain groups of people. Okay, so human rights is for everyone, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of, you know, uh, the different social categories that exist today. All right. So that's the first thing that we need to consider. That's also why it's very important to be coordinating with different um, actors during an, um, an emergency response so that we can, you know, ensure that we are not trespassing or stepping on the rights of others, and we are not duplicating certain activities so that other rights can be met also, okay? Second principle is that of participation. When we talk about MHPSS, actually uh, about programming, you know, uh, things for the community, it is very important that we tap first and foremost, the local community. We try to uh, identify their, you know, their resilience, their, their willingness to, um, you know, to participate in the response, not just in the relief, but also in the planning, in the, you know, crafting of different programs, which they believe will work for the community. Because let's admit it, there are times um, an NGO or an INGO might end up going to a community having already this preconceived idea of what will work for the community without realizing it's not going to work because of certain cultural factors that they forgot to 
consider. So it is important uh, when we're doing MHPSS work, we need to um, uphold or you know follow the principle of participation, engage the community itself. Actually, when we do that, we're not just, you know, um, getting their thoughts, we're actually empowering them. We're making them realize, especially during a disaster, that there is so much that they can do, that they are not victims, they are survivors. And uh, inshallah, they, they will move from just simply surviving to flourishing, inshallah. Okay. Third is the principle of do no harm. Actually, it's related to the first two as well. Okay, the do no harm principle highlights the importance of you know coordination and getting to know the community um, where you will be responding. All right, before going to a community, let's learn what their values are or what they are upholding. Later on, when we discuss the development of Islamic MHPSS in the Philippines, um, you will see how important this do no harm principle is, okay? Then you also have building on available resources. Actually, it's highly connected to participation. When we talk about participation, we're engaging the local stakeholders, we're, we're engaging the community. So part of um, MHPSS and actually humanitarian response in general is um, doing a needs assessment, doing a resource assessment or capacity, uh, what do you call this, mapping, okay, resource mapping. So you want to know what's existing there, what can be um, strengthened, what can be built on, okay, so that you will not be starting from scratch, you will not be starting from zero. And in fact, when you build on available resources, again, we are, uh, what do you call this, we are respecting the culture that is adaptive in that community, and we are empowering the members of that community, all right? Uh, we are also avoiding the possibility of developing in the community what we call learned helplessness, okay? Learned help helplessness, they feel like they are, um, you know, they cannot do anything for themselves and for their community, and they will simply rely on the um, donors or the funding organizations or the humanitarian um, INGOs or NGOs to provide support to them, okay? Now, um, another principle is the integrated support systems. Um, what makes um, a humanitarian response really uh, work or what makes it successful is if we can try to avoid standalone services. Meaning to say, um, if you are an organization and you want to respond to a community and you already have a certain group in mind, that's okay. However, it's important that you also coordinate with the cluster, meaning to say with the other organizations or um, agencies in the area that are providing services. Why? So that you can refer clients or refer uh, community members needing help to one another. All right. So for example, if you are a standalone service and you want to focus only on um, children, okay, or child protection or um, um, youth programming, what will happen if you don't have any funding for, let's say, livelihood, or you don't have funding for parenting sessions, for example, it will be nice if you can coordinate with other agencies that are providing this uh, services so that, you know, uh, the different elements are coming together to help the community bounce back after an emergency and even after an emergency to, you know, prepare for disasters and to make the community something that's really reflective of, you know, positive well-being. And then last principle would be the multi-layered supports. Uh, this will be reflected in the pyramid that I will be showing to you. Okay, later on when we talk about response, but just to give you an idea, people during disasters have different needs. And what's nice is if you have layered supports that are simultaneously working so that the different needs of people at different levels can be addressed, inshallah. So when you talk about multi-layered supports, um, the IASC document or the guidelines uh, will present to you this intervention pyramid. Okay, it's not Maslow's pyramid no, or hierarchy of needs, but it's something in a way reflective of that, okay? Um, think of it this way. 
this is your pyramid. This is your uh, response uh, or your intervention uh, framework. Uh, it's important that first and foremost, you consider the, the basic services and the security of the people and the server service providers, okay? So when you go to a community, yes, we're talking about psych psychology here, Islamic psychology or psychology in general or mental health in general, but you do not go to a community and directly do psychosocial processing. You need to see first if their basic needs are being addressed, okay? So are they in a safe location? Do they have, have they been given food? Um, do they have the uh, necessary clothing, the necessary place to to sleep, to rest? Is there uh, are there portalettes installed in an area? Imagine all those things that can actually affect the mental health of a person um, being disregarded. What will happen, right? So no matter how much processing or psychological uh, processing you do, if the person is hungry or thirsty or afraid that a bomb will be falling anytime soon or there will be an attack in the area or another flash flood will happen, uh, the processing will not be effective at all. Okay, so we need to consider first and foremost the basic needs of the, the individuals or the community concerned. Second, okay, more than just the basic needs, we need to strengthen community and family support. Okay, so basically, this is this is an example of it. Now, activating the social networks. Um, what do you call this? When you go to an evacuation camp, for example, how do you strengthen the uh, the family? How do you address? the needs of an individual who is a part of a family. So whether we know it or not, if we are an evacuee, for example, or if we are a refugee, for example, the stress that we are, you know, uh, experiencing will most likely be displaced on other people around us. And by experience, we see that people will tend to displace it on the vulnerable groups. For example, if I'm an adult, and I am so stressed, I am wondering what will happen to the family. Um, I'm thinking of the livelihood that's already wiped out because of the flash floods, for example. Uh, most, more often than not, my stress might end up becoming displaced on my children, okay? My children who are unaware of, you know, the, the gravity of the city, they, they know that we had to move, for example, because of a flash flood. They cannot understand uh, you know, how interconnected everything is. So they might be, you know, while I'm thinking of livelihood, while I'm thinking of where to sleep or where we can relocate, uh, they might be wondering, what, when can I go back to school? Or uh, I'm hungry, why can't we eat? Things like that. Um, these questions, although they're very innocent, when you are so stressed, when you are feeling overwhelmed, whether you know it or not, you might end up shouting or worse, hurting physically the child. So it's important that we consider when we're doing um, humanitarian response, particularly MHPSS, it's important to consider strengthening the community and family supports, okay? Then uh, third, you now have the focused non-specialized support. This is where psychological first aid uh, comes into play. So basically here, you have the basic mental health care by your primary health care doctor or nurse or um, the barangay health workers or other community workers who have been trained to do psycho psychological first aid, whether individually or in groups, okay? This is important. Um, for example, if you are to conduct relief operations before the actual release of the goods, okay, to the um, you know recipients, while organizing the goods or while coordinating with the um, evacuation camp managers and other you know, leaders in the community, while people are waiting, you might want to consider doing psychoeducation where people can be um, educated about the typical responses, typical reactions of people when there are overwhelming experiences. You know, just having the, these um, psychoeducation talks will already help lessen the probability of uh, the distress worsening into a case of dysfunction, all right? So that's where the focus non-specialized supports come into play. In the Philippines, 
um, you will notice if you are a teacher, if there are participants here are teachers, you will notice you are being given uh, training on PFA because it's very important that when you face the learners and their families, you are also equipped to you know, process at least their overwhelming emotions, help empower them by you know, ad um, identifying the adaptive strategies for coping. And then finally, you have these specialized services. Now, there are people in the um, affected communities that will be needing specialized help, meaning to say they will be needing the um, attention of a psychiatrist or of a psychiatric nurse, and they might be needing a psychopharmacological approach um, to, so that they can be treated or so that they can go back to to uh, you know, to the wellness continuum, you know, of you know, being well or healthy. So this is where this uh, usually comes in. Um, I just want to say that during disasters, uh, it's not like everyone will be needing drugs or you know, a psychopharmacological approach for treating how they feel or you know, addressing how they feel. Usually it's just 10 to 15% of the population. This percentage, however, grows when you have a man or uh, human-induced or man-made disaster like conflict or wars where it's a different setting compared to a natural disaster. Okay, so this is the, the this is basically the intervention pyramid. I hope uh, we we have a good grasp of it. If you notice, this is the multi-layered support, and there will be different actors in each of these levels. Now, what you want is uh, to have these levels or these actors coordinating with one another. There should be an integrated um, network of uh, service provision. Okay, so. Um, yes, MHPSS started as uh, being considered in emergency settings. However, we also need to consider that in the uh, in recent years, it has evolved. Okay, the global humanitarian community, for example, has realized that when we talk about MHPSS, it's not just applicable for emergencies. It's applicable to different settings, such as primary health care. All right. Um, if you want to, you know, if you want to adopt a trauma-informed approach in your hospitals or in different primary healthcare settings, it's nice to consider MHPSS. Or it's actually not just nice, it's needed to consider MHPSS. Then again, peace building. Uh, MHPSS um, is very much um, needed in peace building. So how do you process the the overwhelming emotions how do you design programs so that people who have experienced you know traumatic events get to cope and get to uh, function in society all right then in education we've also seen mhpss not just education in emergencies but the concept um if you notice that pyramid that I'm talking about, it can actually be reflected in the frameworks of social and emotional learning, as well as social, emotional, and ethical learning. So these are the two um, frameworks that are commonly used in education today. All right. So in other community settings, MHPSS is very, uh, very much needed as well. So for example, you have... Um, conflict mediation or conflict prevention, which is related to peace building too, you might want to um, equip the uh, participants if it's a training of trainers in uh, the basics of MHPSS. You will also have uh, child protection, um, livelihood, you know, economic empowerment. You might want to consider the framework that we are using also in MHPSS. Now, a typical question that usually comes out now in different UN agencies are, uh, is this, no? How are you integrating MHPSS into your, whatever programming you're doing? You could be doing youth programming or peace programming or um, economic empowerment programming. All of these programming that you are doing, the question that they are usually asking now is how are you integrating MHPSS? This uh, became very evident uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic where everybody, you know, uh, not just the ones who 
who got affected or infected with the virus, but even uh, those who did not get infected have to address certain mental health concerns because of the, um, you know, the drastic life lifestyle change or the change in how the systems society is working. So the question now is how are you integrating MHPSS into your programming? If you are a participant here right now and you are a member of a, an organization that that is into uh, community work or you know thinking of designing programs, you might want to consider how are you going to integrate what we just discussed, the framework for um, you know, uh, coming up with effective programs for the community. Um, similarly, if you are um, a student, you might want to consider doing research on MHPSS or designing programs that will evaluate or uh, you know, assess the effectiveness of MHPSS programs in the community, all right? But more importantly, since we're talking about Islamic psychology, um, how are we adopting an Islamic framework when we are integrating MHPSS into our programming? Okay, so let me just check the time. Okay, so inshallah I can, uh, okay, we're three. We're almost at the um, last, uh, I mean, we're, we're almost, this will just be fast, maybe around 20 minutes, okay? So 20 minutes fast, okay. Islamic mental health and psychosocial support. Um, basically, when we talk about Islamic mental health and psychosocial support, it is the application of an Islamic framework when doing MHPSS uh, program or implementing MHPSS programs and activities. Okay, so um, why Islamic MHPSS? So to be able to answer that, it would be nice to share the Philippine experience. Okay. Um, when we talk about the uh, uh, the Muslim experience in the Philippines, uh, we have to be an honest that there are a lot of challenges okay, faced by Muslim Filipino communities with faith being central in their coping. Now, when we talk about Muslim Filipinos, for those who are not Filipinos here in our, um, in our virtual classroom, okay, uh, we just want to share that in the Philippines, okay, the Muslim Filipino community would uh, comprise 11 to 15% uh, of the population. Now, we are a minority in the Philippines, and there are different challenges faced by Muslim Filipino communities. So when we talk about emergencies, for example, uh, Muslim, more often than not, Muslim Filipino communities would have experienced both natural and human-induced disasters, okay? So you would have here natural disasters, earthquakes, um, typhoons, flash floods, these things, but you will also have the conflict, okay? Alhamdulillah, um, I mean, generally speaking, Mindanao is already um, quite peaceful, alhamdulillah, for the different systems and mechanisms in place. However, we also have to, to um, admit that there are instances of, you know, conflict that are happening, whether it's between certain groups and the government or between different groups in the community in the form of family feuds or clan wars, okay? So these are different challenges faced by Muslim Filipino communities. However, when we talk about um, response during emergencies, um, an experience that uh, my MHPSS colleagues and I have, you know, have would be the fact that there is a lack of understanding of what a Muslim Filipino community needs. So a simple example would be having uh, relief goods being delivered to Muslim Filipino communities without the um, responding organizations realizing that Muslim Filipinos do not eat uh, pork or, uh, you know, they, they are not sensitive to the halal needs of Muslim Filipinos. Some would even say, ha, ah, okay, if, if it's a cooked uh, food, for example, or a cooked meal, and then there is pork in the pancit, Okay, for example, some would say, can't you just remove those, those uh, pork bits from the pancit? So imagine that kind of um, stress on a survivor, okay? You just lost your home, 
you just lost your livelihood. Alhamdulillah, your family is complete. In some cases, they are not, okay? You are separated from your family. And then you're so hungry. You haven't eaten anything for the past 12 to 15 hours. And then here comes the food. Alhamdulillah, there's food only to find out that you cannot eat it because there is something that makes the food haram. So it's it's frustrating. It's so, you know, it's... um. It's something that makes you realize how helpless you are right now. Now, some of us, okay, here is the thing when I mentioned faith. Some of us would automatically say, this is a test from Allah. We, we can uh, overcome it. We just have to be patient. Now, here's the good thing. Faith is central to most Muslim Filipinos uh, coping, okay? But, but when I talk about faith, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are religious. They may be spiritual. However, it also has a challenging side, okay? While we may say we are being patient, we are being um, submissive to the qadar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, okay? Or has written for us. Um, there is also a tendency that this interpretation can become, you know, detrimental to the mental health of the Muslim Filipino who is undergoing so much uh, stress or who is overwhelmed by emotions because some people might think of mental health or crying or getting angry or frustrated as automatically a lack of faith. So what happens is they will say, just pray or just do the care or you, uh, astaghfirullah, you do not believe in Allah if you are feeling like that. Okay. Um, it's something that we need to uh, consider when we are doing MHPSS programming in the community. We need to consider how does faith affect the coping of the individual or of the community, okay? That's why um, Mom Aisha Flores and uh, uh, Sister Jmina Basman, another is Dr. Kasmin Ismail, and I uh, wrote that first module on on MHPSS for Muslim Filipinos. So basically, okay, excuse me. Um, basically, it focuses on orienting humanitarian workers to the culture, to the beliefs of Muslim Filipinos and how they can respond in a more appropriate and uh, more sensitive manner to the needs of Muslim Filipinos. So that was in 2016 when we... Um, we came up with that module and then alhamdulillah um after a series of trainings it was uh well received it you know certain trainings were conducted even more even during the um outbreak of the marawi conflict and uh different groups now are trying to uh, apply that alhamdulillah so basically through that module that we we started we realized that okay from simply orienting or you know sharing to people to humanitarian workers whether they are muslims or not the beliefs the culture of muslim filipinos okay so that they can respond to disasters um in accordance with the principles of mhpss slowly we realize that wow uh, maybe we need to really advocate more for this islamic framework of mhpss why because um if you've noticed in the previous slide, I, I showed that MHPSS is being integrated now into different fields or into different, um, you know, areas of concern in the community. So uh, you have um, uh, humanitarian actors combining the social cultural approach with the biological approach. Now, similarly, um, you have people seeing that you know, um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with it, the need to apply the bioecological systems approach. And when you think of all those um, paradigms or frameworks that we are using, we, uh, we realize that it's very Islamic, actually, except for certain um, lacking pieces, okay? It's, uh, when we talk about Islamic or M Islamic MHPSS, okay, it's very holistic, it's very integrative okay because basically it's like what i mentioned a while ago it looks at the person not just a biological or not just a body but it considers the spirituality it considers the different domains of human life and islam has you know um prescriptions 
to, to address the different uh, challenges that a person may face in those different uh, domains of life is applicable not just during emergency settings. In fact, the framework is applicable to, to basically uh, coming back to uh, or calling people to a fit -re society, you know, or to developing a fit -re society. That's a fit -re society is something I remember from Professor uh, Rasjid Skinner. Uh, he, he talks about, you know, using Islamic psychology to help people go back to their fitra, their inclination to good, as well as to um, um, creating a society that's centered on their relationship with the divine, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to doing what is good, okay? So why Islamic MHPSS also? Because basically it's a very rights-based approach. Now, when you talk about MHPSS, when you talk, talk about the uh, glo global humanitarian community, we're always talking about um, using a rights-based approach, not a needs-based approach, okay? What's the difference? Um, when you talk about the rights-based approach, you are basically highlighting the responsibility, the accountability of certain individuals or groups or systems to, you know, give the needs of the um, the the public. Okay, when it's just a needs-based approach, there there is no sense of accountability. There is no sense of urgency that I have to do something to help address the need of this individual. Okay, however. When you talk of uh, Islam, right from the start, it's a very rights-based approach. Um, because when you talk about the Maqasid al-Sharia or the aims or the goals of Islamic law, okay, they are basically for public welfare or the, the goodness or the, the benefit of man, not just in this world, okay, that's basically the secular MHPSS focusing on this world. But when you talk about Islamic MHPSS, it's focusing both in this world and the hereafter okay so the, the the basic you know uh it's it's a different lecture altogether but just to give you an idea when we talk about the sharia or the or islam it it aims uh for the goodness of the individual and of society and of humankind by focusing on you know the basic would be the protection of life protection of religion uh protection of uh the intellect protection of lineage or dignity and protection of wealth now usually you you hear this concept in islamic finance however if you look at the literature it's something that's related to human life in all its aspects okay so it's something that helps us um you know stick to the right path okay so basically it's the promotion and protection of good and the prevention of evil so when you talk about the rights based approach that is islam it focuses not just also on our own rights, okay? You're not just focused on your own rights, you're also focused on your responsibilities. Are you giving, are we giving the rights of our body, the rights of our family, the rights of our neighbors? You know? So basically it's, um, it's this kind of rights-based approach because we know that we will be held accountable in this world and the next. So, um, so it's it's if you think of Islamic MHPSS, it's um, calling us to build a society that is centered on goodness and uh, upholding what is good and preventing what is evil, which is basically what's happening in the different movements right now, particularly in the education setting. For example, you have the Dalai Lama Center that already started the social, emotional, and ethical learning approach, uh, which basically is something that um, Islam, the Islamic framework has been um, advocating, okay? By the way, when I also talk about the Maqasid of Sharia, when we talk about the protection of life, religion, this applies to everyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, because um, part of Islam is to acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created different uh, groups of people. It is his will that there are people who are Muslims, there are people who are non-Muslims, and it um, he is calling, um, calling us to compete in goodness, okay? And it will be him who will show us what uh, our differences are and what is right uh, on, on Yawm al Qiyamah, okay? So uh, you might be wondering, what is the basis of this framework I am talking about? 
basically, it's based on the concept of Khalifa, you know, the, uh, the human being being a, a successor or being a vicegerent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? There are many verses in the Quran that talks about uh, mankind being the successor placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. I remember in our module before, we presented uh, the one from Surah Al-Baqarah, um, um, verse 32, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels that he will be creating man as a vicegerent on earth. However, later on, um, we we believe that this surah would be, I mean, this ayah, um, basically reflects more okay the, that framework and shows the accountability and responsibility of man okay and it is he who has made you successors upon the earth and has raised some of you above others in degrees of rank that he may try you through what he has given you indeed your lord is swift in penalty but indeed he is forgiving and merciful okay so when you look at the verse it shows there the the accountability, the, the responsibility first, the responsibility that is given to mankind, which is basically to, uh, you know, to, to make use in a proper, in a right way, and to take care of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted to us, okay, that he has given to us. So it you know, how, what are we doing with our body? What are we doing with our heart? What are we doing with our time? All of these things, okay? And similarly, the ayah talks about the fact that there will be social categories in this world. There will be those who uh, will be different based on their, you know, race or race or color. They will be different based on their gender or their age group or, you know, their, their social economic status, all of these things are meant by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were placed there by Allah as a test for us so that we can, you know, we can work in an integrated manner, supporting one another, okay, multi-layered support, okay, so that, you know, he can test who is making use of what he has given to us in a positive or a beneficial way. All right. So you talk about uh, responsibility. You talk about differences. Okay. Uh, which also is a reflection of unity because it's a test for us. Okay. Um, to work and to help one another. And it also talks about accountability because whatever we are doing, however we are living, our, leading our lives and making use of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted to us, we will be uh, questioned about that and there will be a penalty if we are you know um if we deviated from the path and there will also be forgiveness and mercy if you know it's normal for us individuals to you know uh fluctuate when it comes to our faith we it's normal for us it's part of being human to lose our way at certain points in our life but inshallah we will also find our way back to what is right and apply this framework of of human life in um in our own lives first and foremost and ask repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing uh that he is um oft forgiving and merciful okay so if you want to see this in a diagram okay or a, a framework consider Islam as encompassing everything again it is not uh this is the difference between what we were trained in school okay and Islam in the Islamic perspective Islam is not just a very small component of the social cultural uh, domain of human life, okay? It is encompassing all parts of human life. And when we talk about Islam, again, it is uh, based on, we apply the Quranic worldview and the prophetic example, okay? From the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, you first consider the person who is made up of both a spiritual heart and body, okay? So when you think of coming up with programs, not just for others, but start again with yourself, because on um, on Yamul Qiyama, you will be held accountable first and foremost for your own life, right? So you need to consider first and foremost the person, okay? Then that person will have an influence, okay? And will be influenced by the people in his home, all right? And then aside from the home, Okay, that person is a member of a community and whatever happens in the community can affect the person to a certain extent. And that person operating 
within the home and in the community, okay, can also help shape the community, okay? So it's a bi-directional relationship. Then, of course, it's not, it doesn't end in the community. You also have to consider that as a Muslim, you have to be, we have to be uh, contributing to nation building. We have to be active in, you know, developing a, uh, you know, um, uh, a sound, uh, an ethically grounded uh, nation, okay? And then, of course, it's not enough that you just focus on your own country or your own community or your own home, because we are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being interconnected to one another. So you will have to consider as well other people around the world, the, the mankind around the world. Think about climate change, for example, right? Um, how we are utilizing our resources in this part of the world affects other people in another part of the world. Think about water shortage. Think about um, think about hunger, right? I mean, hunger is the the top uh, cause of you know uh, death in the world. Uh, Subhanallah. And yes, we talk about uh, animate beings and the world. So it's not just about you. The accountability of man being a successor in this world is not just about his relationship with other human beings. It talks about his accountability. It talks about his responsibility. It talks about how he relates to other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. How are we taking care of the wildlife? How are we utilizing our natural resources? So are we committing israf? Okay. Israf or uh, wastefulness. So all these things we need to consider because we can influence, we have an um, effect to a certain degree in individually to all these concentric circles. And we also can be affected by these concentric circles um, in return, okay? Um, and when we talk about all these concentric circles, by the way, you 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 might want to read the works of Imam Al Ghazali and Ustad Bedizaman Said Nursi to understand this more. Okay, um, I already mentioned this a while ago. We are also encompassed by the element of time. Okay, we have to consider performing our responsibilities, checking our rights. Okay, privileges and our ability to give the rights of others within the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us in this world. So there has to be that sense of urgency within each of us, all right, um, to develop a, a good community, okay, because we know that our time on earth is limited. Similarly, this concept of time is reflected in the fact that uh, when we talk about Islam, it shows us that there are different ways of dealing with people in different um, developmental stages of human life, okay? We don't treat um, a child, we don't deal with a child or we don't relate to a child exactly the same way as we relate to a grown-up, okay? There are certain rights and responsibilities for each uh, group of people depending on their um, life stage, all right? So again, we... but. Like what I mentioned, we have to start with first and foremost our own self or our spiritual heart or the kalb. Okay. So when we talk about the kalb or the heart, okay, um, you we need to develop that uh, spiritual heart so that we can reach, um, we can develop a nafs, okay, a self that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no nafs al mutma'ina. Okay. However, it's not that easy because just briefly, okay, because this is a different lecture again altogether. Um, it's not that easy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given us innate powers to get what we need in this world, okay? We have the shahwa or the animal appetite, the one that helps us, you know, um, uh, get, I mean, um, what do you call that? Address our needs, our basic needs, our, our desire for pleasure, our desire for what is good or what is you know, pleasing to us, that would be shahwa. And then there's also ghadab, or uh, in other books, it's called raw anger or savage passion. This is this helps us to defend ourselves when we are threatened, okay, or when or or when we are facing harm. 
okay? And then we are we are also given the power of the akal, okay? But when we, we talk when we talk about the akal or the intellect, uh, we need to develop it by seeking Islamic knowledge so that we can, you know, develop that fifth level or the angelic intellect that will help us um, make use of shahwa and radab in a moderate fashion, meaning to say not falling into deficiency or excess because we are trying to maintain a moderate way of life, which is Islam, okay? However, at the same time, we have that uh, element called the satanic element or the shaitaniya, the was was, and even our own nafs that can pull us to do excesses in, you know, in all our powers, okay? And that's something that we need to consider. Now put it in an MHPSS perspective, think of disaster, for example, you might want to consider, oh, okay, why, what will help that person uh, calm down? What will help that person go back to, you know, to what is good? Because if the if if you have a disaster and then the home, the community is disrupted, then there is a tendency to for a person to either fall into deficiency in his use of his shahwa or ghadab or excess. For example, if the person is already falling into despair, okay, which means a uh, you know deficiency, for example, in shahwa, the person doesn't want to eat. The, the person doesn't want to talk to anyone. The person doesn't want to interact or, you know, take care of oneself. That's an example of a deficiency in, in the animal appetite. But then if you have a person who is so overwhelmed and getting angry and, and ending up, you know, committing gender-based violence, abusing or hurting the wife because of all the stress that's happening, okay, then you have a person who is going into the excesses of Radab, for example, okay? So similarly, in the community, we have to consider how can, how can we uh, make people understand that it's, it's normal for people to feel different emotions or overwhelming emotions when they are um, face, facing trials. But at the same time, we have the capacity to, to adopt, you know, healthy strategies for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So when we talk about Islamic MHPSS, it's basically correct understanding and application of lessons from the Quran and Ahadith in educating people about health and illness and promoting a halal lifestyle. So it's not just about um, addressing mental health stigma or mental illness stigma, okay? It's about helping people go back to their, um, to that halal lifestyle, to that, that uh, to their fitra, okay? Uh, strengthening the fitra. So, for example, when you talk about uh, I, I, as much as possible, I don't want to give so many specific examples because um, it's a separate training in itself. Just, just to give you an example, sometimes we we pick certain verses of the Quran and then apply it or share it with a person, but the timing is wrong. Okay, you might end up saying, "Do not be sad" or uh, "Just do the care," <laughs> things like that. But at that moment, what you need to do as part of psychological first aid is to first listen to the person, to acknowledge what the person is doing, making use of Quran verses as well, you know, sharing about, for example, about Yaqub alayhi salam, that yes, uh, grief is uh, grief or extreme emotion or sadness is normal for anyone, even the prophets, even the Sahaba, all, all experience this, okay? And it has consequences to our, to our physical body, just like, um, remember that verse where um, Brother Mustafa, <laughs> Mustafa, okay, Mustafa mentioned it a while ago in the opening prayer. Okay, um, it's uh, because of extreme grief he became blind. Yaqub Salam became blind. So we see that extreme emotions, if not processed, um, have an effect on our physiological state. Okay, then Islamic MHPSS is also application of the lessons of the Quran and a Hadith in responding to emergencies and conducting PFA, psychosocial processing sessions, coaching, counseling, and psychotherapy. It's similarly needed when you talk about social, emotional, and ethical learning in education. It's also applicable when you talk about social welfare and development programs and services. So when we talk in MHPSS, we usually talk about vulnerable groups. 
uh, Islam has been highlighting that right from the start. So when you talk about, for example, when you talk about sadaqah, uh, there are priority groups or there are groups mentioned in the Quran um, to whom we can give our sadaqah and even our zakat, right? So this can be a framework. This is something that we can use when we talk about social welfare and development programs and services. Do we have programs and services for we widows, for single moms, for um what do you call this for children, for orphans, for the disabled, all these groups of people, we need to consider them, okay? And then yes, it's also applicable to human rights and empowerment, okay? And peace building, conflict prevention, mediation, and resolution. So Ritul Hujurat, for example, is very rich in, um, in you know, lessons that we can use for peace building, conflict prevention, mediation, and resolution. All right. So uh, generally, challenges. Okay, challenges that uh, we we face. Okay, first, individual, cultural, and other barriers to the widespread adoption and application of an Islamic framework. So we already have a framework. Mashallah, alhamdulillah, it's been there. It's been you know. Uh, taught to us by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's been, you know, explained by a lot of scholars. Let's continue to learn about them. But then, why is it not being implemented? Why is it not being adopted? Because it could be at an individual level, we lack the knowledge. We're not seeking Islamic knowledge. We we may have ended, you know, with the seeking of knowledge, uh, you know, with what our with what our professors, with what um curriculum our college you know or universities offer to us but we need to continuously seek islamic knowledge so that we can enrich our lives and others similarly we may have the knowledge but then we are lacking in applying it okay another is uh cultural okay cultural and other religious barriers actually uh cultural factors would be some people identify for example as a muslim but then the practices that we see in the community um, are actually not reflective of what Islam really is. So this is something that we also need to work on, okay? Another barrier would be, you know, within our own homes, okay? Uh, maybe our, our own parents, maybe our elders are not applying or are not aware of this Islamic knowledge. So it's hard to, to you know, apply it. Um, similarly, in a in a bigger in the bigger circles or concentric circles that we have, maybe we are in a society where um, you know legislation is still needed to come up with a framework that that considers a very holistic and integrated approach to health and wellness. Okay. Um, again, another challenge, we have a lot of mental health professionals in MHPSS, for example. However, maybe what's lacking is the the knowledge and application of Islamic psychology. So this is very critical. If we are going to um, address the needs of Muslim Filipinos or Muslims in different parts of the world, let's continue to seek knowledge of uh, Islamic psychology so that we can, you know, um, we're going to help anyway, we're going to assist in the in the personal development, in the healing of a person. Why not, uh, you know, why not make it to the best that we can by applying Islamic principles, okay? And then yes, similarly, Religious leaders and other community leaders actually need to be trained in MHPSS, PFA, or counseling. There are there are leaders in our community who are very um, what do you call this? Who are who are knowledgeable or who 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 have memorized the Quran, for example, or who have read a lot of hadith. However, they need to be trained in uh, Islamic chaplaincy. How do you talk to someone or how do you process someone who? Who, is, who lost a loved one, for example. Uh, we, we do not simply just release the verses like that, okay? Uh, we need to follow the prophetic way of doing it, the timing and everything. So these are the challenges that we are facing, okay? And then, of course, another is integration of existing efforts of different stakeholders. So you have a lot of stakeholders. You have a lot of groups that are doing projects that may be implementing is the Islamic framework already. However, what is lacking is their coordination and, you know, communication with one another. All right. So uh, ways forward. This is very quick. 
what are the ways forward for this? Um, first, of course, let's focus on our area of control. If you found the um, session beneficial, if you find found it applicable, inshallah, uh, we need to first and foremost, it's a reminder to myself, first and foremost, to start with our area of control. And when we talk about area of control, it is our own selves. We need to constantly uh, purify you know, our hearts, okay, our spiritual hearts. Mm -hmm. Let's work on that. Let's um, continue to seek knowledge. And then from there, we can slowly work on our areas of influence. So from what we discussed today, you, you might want to ask, um, we might want to ask ourselves, what is lacking in me? Uh, how can I develop this? How can I uh, adopt this Islamic framework in my own life so I can, you know, I can maintain a halal lifestyle or I can promote mental health? promote and preserve my mental health and wellness, okay? Then from there, I apply it to my family, okay? Or to my home, because that's the first circle or concentric circle that, you know, where you have the most influence. If you are a parent, there were a lot of parents in the group who registered. How are you going to apply Islamic teachings in your own homes, okay? Um, are, are we being a good model to our own families, okay? Then, of course, from the different areas of influence, from the home to your immediate community, to the different groups in that community, without you knowing it, you're, we are already um, contributing to addressing the issues in our areas of concern, okay? So we have to work first in our area of control, educate our own selves first, apply it, then educate our homes and the different uh, microsystems that we have in the community, then slowly um, contribute to the areas of concern. It would be wrong to get stuck in the areas of concern, you know, climate change, uh, conflict everywhere. Yes, it's an area of concern. But if you are getting overwhelmed by all of those things, yet you are not doing anything, we are not doing anything to change ourselves first and foremost, start with our own selves and then our homes, then it will not, uh, you know, change will not really, positive change will not really um, take place. All right. So I'd like to end with uh, this hadith. Okay. Ibn Abbas reported, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, take advantage of five before five. Okay. So again, reminding ourselves that in the framework, we have a limited time to do all of these things uh, or to fulfill our responsibilities. Okay. We have a limited time and we will be held accountable for all our um, responsibilities for all that has been entrusted to us. Okay. So we need to take advantage of five before five. Okay. Your youth before your old age, your health before your illness, your riches before your poverty, your free time before your work, and your life before your death. Okay, so I hope that uh, you found the session beneficial, inshallah. Anything you found beneficial is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And any mistake is uh, from me and I ask for your forgiveness for, for that. We will be proceeding to the Q&A. And um, for the q and A, I will. I am honored to have with us also um, my co-authors and my co-trainers, my colleagues, my sisters in Islam. Um, we have Miss Aisha Flores. Okay, she is um, she's actually a Sharia counselor and one of the you know one of the the advocates of Islamic mental health ever since. Um, she's been working with uh, women in correctional institutions and even in the community. Uh, Subhanallah, Mashallah, Tabarakla, may Allah preserve her. Um, she is uh, an advocate not only of Islamic mental health, but also of Islamic um, finance, okay, and halal. Okay, Mashallah, we'll have uh, Sister Aisha to address your questions also. And we also have Sister Tajmina, uh, Ana Tajmina Basman, who is the founder of Psy Creatives. And um, she is also, uh, both of them are uh, members of the, in the International Association of Muslim Psychologists. And uh, Sister Tajmina is continuously doing um, mental health, uh, coaching, mental health, um, counseling sessions online. And she's also the author of Dean in the Metro. Okay. So basically, uh, it's, it's she's uh, been active also in the humanitarian field. She was the regional coordinator of HHRD. 
um, helping hands for relief and development, you know, a, a U.S. Um, organization that helps, you know, Muslim communities primarily. So, I know I took too much of your time. I believe that Sister Iman also shared this uh, links in the um, what's uh, in in the in the chat box. I'm just flashing them now. We also sent it to your email if you registered, okay? So with that, I want to end with a dua. Subhanaka la ilma lana, ila ma'alam tana ina ka antal alimul hakim, wa akhiru dawa, wa dawana anil alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, I think my daughter is online. Okay, Janam, we are not yet done. We might we will be having our QA. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you're done when you said that because Okay. <laughs> That's our little um um MHPSS um processor. <laughs> my daughter. Okay, I'm I'm going back to the messages. All right. Um, okay. Can you can can you can you share where we can enroll courses about Islamic psychology, especially for those who don't have background in psychology? Um, okay. I'm actually enrolled in Al Balag. Okay, Academy, uh, um, you can take the courses online. Um, I think the ISIP website also has a list of those courses. You can also check the IM, IAMP website because it also lists the different courses there. Um, uh, what do you call this? Sis, uh, Sis Iman, for example, is a, a graduate of uh, the Islamic Psychology Program from Cambridge. And it was online, right? Sis Iman, it was online, Tamaba. <laughs> Yes, sister, alhamdulillah, it was online. Okay, so um, inshallah, we can we we can also post these uh, these links to our um, you know to our groups, Islamic mental health group. Okay, uh, are there? Okay, I'm I'm going through the questions now. And okay, how can you deliver a purpose about Islam in? Okay, in way integrated with 5D knowledge, most people developing contrib contribution to society for their accountability, but how it's related in combined these two ways effectively. Okay, um, you know, a good source of this 5D knowledge would be if you if um, you read the works of uh, Ustad Bediu Zaman Said Nursi, Okay, if you if you are familiar with the Risale Nur collection, actually that was one of the basis of of our framework, um, what do you call this, uh, of our framework when coming up with the manual or the module on the MHPSS for Muslim Filipinos. Um, oh, what do you call this? Oh, yes, we talked about, I, I mentioned a while ago, when we talk of the intellect or the akal, um, it has to be in the fifth level, right? Um, where you where you're already developing this this connection you you it's a spiritual intellect where you have a strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but part of getting there is to develop your basic cognitive functions where you are uh trying to connect everything uh trying to develop a way of thinking in a in a in a child for example that is uh sensitive or that is conscious of his creator. It could be as simple as giving, uh, using stories in the beginning, okay? Um, stories from the Quran, um, stories of the Sahaba, okay, uh, the different ahadith, and then trying to trying to relate that to what the person is experiencing in daily life. And then um, not only that, not, I mean, this is very religious education, but at the same time, complementing that uh, learning experience by integrating the typical secular courses, okay, or it's secular subjects um, with Islamic consciousness. So when you talk about math, for example, when you talk about science, for example, it's important, especially if you are a teacher, that you are relating whatever the person is um, 
learning to his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so when you're learning about the human body, for example, when you're learning anatomy, for example, or anatomy and physiology, for example, it's important to highlight to children or to students, um, you know, the 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 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that makes that uh, possible, you know, the the system, the perfect system of how we are created um then from there of course you you will also help the person uh not just through analogies analogical thinking or analytical thinking you slowly develop in them reflective thinking thinking of you know um their lives their experiences society all those things um okay I hope I and I understood the question correctly. If if not, I, I I apologize for that. If Sister Mina or Sister Aisha has anything to add, um, please feel free to unmute yourselves also. <laughs> okay. Okay. How and where do grassroots organizations request for MHPS training? Okay. How and where do grassroots organizations? Um. Okay. Yes, we do. MHPSS trainings, it's separate, no? it's separate from ISIP, Philippines, I just want to highlight that. Um, our endeavors in ISIP are, are um, inshallah, will be, will be counted at Sadaqah Jaria. However, when it comes to trainings, just like most of the scholars and our teachers um, um, in, in ISIP and other institutions, we're giving this separately. You may you may want to send us an email so that we can coordinate with you. Maybe I can send my my email. Uh, usually we do we if we do this. Um, I'm based in Turkey now. The 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 trainings I've done so far are virtual. Sister Tajmina is also uh, based in Malaysia. Uh, Sister Aisha, Mama Aisha is based in the Philippines. So. Uh, maybe you can coordinate. Uh, I'll, I'll give my email address right now. I'm sending it. Um, you may want to coordinate, uh, send us an email there. Okay. Or you can also there. Uh, yeah, Philippines at uh, isip.foundation. Uh, inshallah, Sis Iman will also be able to um, virtual and face to face. Sana. Okay. Mashallah. Mashallah. Um, let's, let's see how we can. Um, um, organize that. Okay, then. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, Sheikh Izhar Ulha from Kashmir, India. How is Islamic psychology uh, psychology motivating us on poor life? I mean, with less income. Okay. Um, basically, it, let me see if I understood the question correctly. How can we use Islamic psychology? or the Islamic teachings to, to motivate the, you know, uh, members of the community who are in poverty, right? Uh, or, in, uh, or with less income. So I think if we go back to the framework again, um, we, before I discuss the framework, um, we have to consider that yes, there are people who were born with limited means right from the start. Like, like for example, um, I can I am not a millionaire. <laughs> I am not a millionaire. I may have limited um, um, what you call this financial means at present. So maybe I will qualify as someone with um, someone with less income, right? Now, before I discuss that framework or share that framework, and I believe Mama Aisha will also be able to add a lot to this area, um, we can also look at it um what happens to a person who who has who is in that state okay so maybe when you're saying how do we motivate does it mean that that person is already in a learned helpless state i mentioned learned helplessness a while ago some people will say this is my kadar i am poor you need to help me okay uh, i cannot do anything with the life that i have been you know that has been written for me so there's that there's that uh, learned helplessness mindset. So I think but when going back to that framework uh, where we talk about the responsibility and accountability of everyone, we, we need to see, we need to empower the person. We need to make the person see that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, you know, given us so much 
uh, blessings in the form of good health, for example, in the form of, um, uh, you know, um, capacities that we can use to continuously uh, work and, you know, um, um, make ourselves better individuals. So that would be one. Um, I, I, I can't give too many details right now. It will be a whole discussion um, on its own. Sister Aisha, I think, or uh, Sister Mina can also relate that because although we're, we're trying to motivate the person, if you go back to the framework, there are concentric circles affecting the person. A person may be giving him his, his best, but the circles around him are, you know, confining or suffocating the person. I think Mom Aisha has a lot of inputs to this as well, and Sis Nina. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no, I just came from, you know, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to congratulate you, Ma uh, Mabrook, Sister Jane, for giving a very informative and very enriching um, talk about Islamic psychology. Um, we, we say that the, this is a maiden work for the East Philippines. No? We're trying to um, introduce Islamic psychology through East Philippines. And then for the question of our dear brother, Sheikh, Sino ba ito? Uh, Sheikh Izar Ulhaq? Yeah? Uh, I guess, you know, we, we start with counting our blessings. That's the first one. You know, um, giving emphasis on the very many blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. For example, there are, uh, there are a lot of free things in life which money cannot buy. For example, the very fact that we are, uh, we wake up every morning is, an, is a chance for, you know, receiving all the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And first, then we, we teach our clients not to look at other people who are, who are more than what they have. Always look at those who have less than what you have. Because uh, if your gauge is the people have more in life, definitely the end result will be you're, you'll end up being depressed because there is a tendency for the person to, you know, to, to um, compare the blessings of Allah upon one person to another person. Remember, uh, it is Allah who is giving us everything. It is Allah who has decreed for how much you're going to have in this world and how much you're going to have in the hereafter. And always, uh, we give a positive thought on our clients that whatever we feel and whatever we experience in life has a reward in the hereafter. Nothing in our works in this life, in this, in this dunya, is being lost. Everything has a price in the hereafter. We may not be able to have it here, the good life that we are dreaming of, and maybe because there is a reason for it. There are something that we like for ourselves, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't let us experience because of the wisdom that only Allah knows. And there are things in life that we feel that are better, but Allah knows that that will not be better for you. He is the one who is giving us um, the, the, the proper place under the sun. And then uh, all of these trials are, but all, everything that is happening in our life is but a trial. And then there is always a reward if ever we pass this trial. So nothing is lost, everything is gained. You know, uh, that, is, that, that is one. I think that there are many other ways how can we help uh, clients who are less, to have less in life. And then we can, we can have a one-on-one -on, -one, on, -one on this, inshallah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you just have to email us and then we can talk about this outside this forum, inshallah. I think um, um, Taj has something yeah. to say also. Yeah. Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam from Kuala Lumpur. Um, I just want to thank you so much, uh, Sheikh Izar al for that question. And I just want to... I don't know where the question is coming from, but I just want to affirm that um, asking that question in the first place could be tricky for some, right? Yeah. So uh, in general, like I agree with what Sister Aisha and then Sister Jane has said, and I just want to further emphasize what Sister Jane has said earlier uh, about focusing on the things that are within our control. So regardless of like you are poor or whatever challenges that we have in life, I always try to remind 
my clients that um, there are things that are within our control and then there are things that are outside our control. So as humans, regardless of your religion or things like that, um, there really are things that are outside our control. But what I encourage my clients is to focus on the things that are within our control. Like maybe if your challenge is in relation to finances, maybe just um, I'm not saying that this is easy, but that this is the practical and realistic thing to do. Uh, look at the things that you can do. Like you cannot control what other people are gonna tell you. You also cannot control whether you cannot control whether you will get the job or not. What you can control is to apply for jobs. You can control whether you would have to adjust the lifestyle so that you have or things like that or maybe you can control setting a routine so that if you feel that your life is like a blur uh, your life is directionless but you can control it, the fact that you can set up your schedule or things like that so i am encouraging people to focus on the things that are within their control so that they don't feel like they are trapped in their situation that they can do something about their situation so this is not toxic positivity because i'm not saying that you deny the existence of your problem i'm just saying that you focus on the things that are within your control so that you feel empowered you feel that you are proactive about your situation so um you also while you are focusing on the things that are within your control, you also need to recognize the things that are outside your control as a form of reality check because you don't live in a vacuum, right? And then as Muslims, since your question is about in relation to Islamic psychology, as Muslims, we are rewarded based on our effort, not based on the result because we have to remember that as Muslims, um, Allah is in charge of the outcome. The input or whatever we do in this life uh, we get rewarded by that. Like we get rewarded whether it's difficult to wake up or fajr or subu. Um, we get rewarded with the effort that we are doing, but and ultimately Allah will uh, will decide whatever the outcome is. So I hope this doesn't give us the unnecessary pressure of having to be perfect all the time. As Muslims, we are a people of the process. Uh, the outcome will always rely uh, will be upon Allah, inshallah. So in a nutshell, I just want to focus on the fact that. Focus on the things that are within your control while recognizing the things that are outside your control. And then that's where your dua can come in. Like if you feel that this aspect of your life is not within your control, you do your action, you do your part, but then you also make dua because we recognize that Allah is in control of everything. So just a quick concept on Islam, right? Tawakul, people think that tawakul is relying upon Allah and then that's it. Remember, there's a hadith that says that uh, you tie your camel, and put your trust in Allah. So it means that you need to do something about your situation and you put your trust in Allah. So another example is um, uh, Maryam alayhi salam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. She sought the help of Allah when she was um, having that hardship or uh, experiencing the birth pains. And then she sought the help of Allah, but she was asked to shake the tree. So she's already... Uh, in a difficult situation, but she was asked to shake the tree, and then when she shook the tree, um, the date um, uh, uh, fruit fell off, and then when she ate it, that's when the ease came in. So that is uh, doing your part, and then like you seek the help of Allah, and then you still you need to do your part. And then another example is when Prophet Nuh alayhi salam um, was informed that there will be a calamity in his nation, uh, he was asked to build a boat. So definitely Allah will help them. But then at the same time, he was, he was still asked to do something about their situation that is to build a boat. And then last example that I always use is uh, in the case of Prophet uh, Musa alayhi salam. They're being chased after the, by the people of their own or Pharaoh. And then um, so the Israelites and things like that. So and they're being chased after by the people of their own and then he sought the help of Allah and he was told to strike the staff and then that's when the body of water uh, split into two. So it means that Allah will help them but then they also need to do their part. So this also emphasizes the fact that we are not 100% helpless. Allah has enabled us to do something about our situation while putting our trust in him. So when you do something about your situation, like seeing a specialist or talking to someone about your situation, I hope we don't get the impression that it means that we don't have tawakul, we don't trust in Allah. Because we, there's also um, a verse in the Quran that says that as the people of knowledge, we do not know. So that also covers the fact that 
if you don't know about this, seeing a specialist, the same way that we would see a doctor, like an orthopedic surgeon, if we have problems with our bones and things like that, it doesn't mean that you don't have tawakul, right? It's also asking the people of knowledge if you do not know. So yeah, I hope I made sense and I, I hope you answered your question, inshallah. Yes, I'm going to go to Sister Aisha and Sister Nina. Um, so I, I want to highlight the <laughs> disclaimer. I want to highlight that uh, our, if you notice the questions, we're trying to refer back first to the framework, to the general concept, the general teachings of Islam. We have to highlight here, if you notice in the in the entire session, we the, the, the talk that we presented as much as we can, we try not to give specific examples first because we we try to principle of do no harm. We try to also avoid the tendency of, you know, uh, sometimes we suddenly share what we learn from a talk, right? It, it was said like this, but we need to consider the timing, okay, the situation, the, you know, the the uh, condition of the person to whom we are talking or to whom we are speaking. Sometimes um, it, it's, it's good that uh, Sister Mina also mentioned the term toxic positivity because that was a challenge for uh, for Sister Aisha, for Sister Mina, and for, for me and other MHPSS workers on the ground. When we're dealing with Muslim Filipino clients. Faith is a very integral part of their coping. However, the use of that at the wrong time or the wrong application of it, alhamdulillah for faith, right? But when we share it with another person who is still in the process of, you know, for us uh, understanding what's happening, overwhelmed by emotion, and then all of a sudden we will be saying, for example, just pray, this is your kadar. It's not exactly very empowering. So again, it will be very important. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. Uh, it's hard for sharing as well. I, I noticed you had follow-up statements there. Yes, money has uh, affected um, individuals to some extent. However, we uh, again, we we automat we cannot automatically say that if a person, if a poor person is getting depressed because of a lack of money, it, it may not necessarily mean that that person already, you know, has become uh, preoccupied with just money, okay? It could be because of a lot of other factors, like maybe the person could seem preoccupied with money or, you know, leaning towards the, you know, uh, excess excess of the shahua, uh, the, uh, the animal appetite that I was mentioning, the greed, for example, okay? But maybe the reason for that person to be acting that way or to be presenting himself or herself that way is because of other uh, members in the concentric circle, okay? What if, for example, you have a child who will be needing treatment, okay? And that will be requiring a lot of money or a parent who will be needing um, hosp hospitalization or you, you have children who need to finish college and all these things. So... Yes, uh, we acknowledge that yes, there are individuals who may have who may have lost the focus and have leaned towards uh, that aspect. They want to become rich for the wrong reasons. However, yes, um, wanting to become rich, okay, is not wrong in Islam, provided that we are centered on our purpose in Islam, uh, provided that we are seeing this as a means to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, okay? It's also because, you know, rich or wealth is part of Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanata wa fi akhirati hasan wa fina zabana, right? So goodness or wealth or richness or, you know, blessings in this world. So what we need to do is to maybe redirect the person to that, uh, aspect if the person is uh, already using that center, okay? So, okay, um, there was a lot. I, I think I will be going to the uh, last question, okay? I think this is the last, uh, second to the last question, okay? Uh, there was a question about how do you handle traumatized people in Islamic perspective? Okay, um, again, I will be giving a very general um, answer to this, okay? Um, when we talk about uh, people with trauma, okay, um, 
let's let's try to use uh, people with trauma. Okay, so we let's uh, let's not define or um, what do you call this describe the person uh, based on uh, a condition or an experience the person has. Okay, so when we talk about people with trauma, there are different trauma. There are different types of trauma. Okay, there could be acute trauma. There could be complex trauma. You know, um, again we go back to the perspective that we are using. Okay, we first, yes, we focus on the physiology. Remember the framework, the person is made up of a physiological body, a heart, and then the home, the community. So yes, you you might want, you will definitely first focus on the person, treat uh, or let the person become aware of the physiological reactions or physiological uh, traces of the trauma on him or her, uh, and then work on that, okay, as, as well as his his mindset or his perception of his situation, all those things, but I don't want to give details because different types of trauma will be requiring different, you know, uh, combination of, of uh, of an approach, of an Islamic approach, okay? What what verse, what hadith, what story uh, to share, it will really depend uh, during the session itself, depending on where the patient is. Uh, but what's important when you talk about a person with trauma, okay? A person with trauma, it, you, you, I mean, the basic would be having the same goal, uh, knowing that the person has that goal, uh, letting the person acknowledge that there is something to work on. And then from there, you come up together with your goals in the session and all those things. Okay. Um, okay. I think I'm going through the questions. Um, I am, yes, yes. Yeah. I also want to add and highlight why maybe you might notice that Sister Jane is not very uh, specific about the, the the answer. It's because we don't want to make a blanket statement because it it might sound irresponsible. Like what if Sister Jane says one statement and then a random listener here would use it every day to random people. And we want to highlight that while we recognize the importance of imparting Islamic psychology to everyone, like what I said in the Islamic verse, I think, I'm not sure if it's Surah an nahal where it says that as the people of knowledge, if you do not know, right? So it's not just a matter of um, saying Islamic verses or Quranic verses. It's about looking at the context and then the readiness of the person and things like that. So maybe someone with both acute traumas, experiences of trauma, would still have different experience, would still have a different experience. So maybe my answer to this is different. And we don't want you to just randomly say, oh, I attended this talk. <laughs> and then I realize that this is what she said. Therefore, this is applicable. If you think this does not convince you then something's wrong with your iman so we don't want that to happen right so that's why i just want to highlight why while why sister jane is not very specific about the approach because we don't want you guys do to no harm. other people yeah do no harm do no harm but thank you so much Yes, and we don't want to make simplistic answers because that's the essence of one-on-one -on -one sessions. Like I remember the more we started experiencing having sessions, the more we realized that, okay, now we have to be more careful of answering questions because it might help us. Like It's simplistic. Like, oh, we just need to do this and then it will work. If it did not work, then something's wrong with your email. So that's not it. So yeah. And I think Sister Aisha yeah. would want to say something else. Yeah, in addition to that, let us treat our client, each and every one is a unique case. So there is no rule of the thumb, there is no one single formula that can be uh, used no, as fit, fit to one, to one uh, client. Always, we have to study now where the client is coming from, what are his, his or her conditions, and then we will never question the level of faith of our client. That is a no-no. And we should always... Submit, Prosolidation is also a no-no in our, uh, in our, um, in the. It's not. Um, we we are not in the position to judge whether the person has a high iman or a weak iman. We cannot do that, and we cannot. We are also not in the position to prosolidize. So what we can do is to guide the 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 client out of the condition, 
and uh, put the responsibility on that person. Um, especially for those who are traumatized, they are relying heavily on the the psychologists or the uh, psychosocial support providers. So it is very, very important that we know how to handle them in a more direct manner. Now, we cannot employ the, the non-directive. No, it's always a directive manner because uh, sometimes they are not in their proper um, mental frame no? to think uh, what is good and what is not proper. And so we have to direct them. So directive counseling is our approach here, but we can never ever question the level of faith. And then we can never also question that the choices that we make. It's just that we are here to guide them and then uh, let them see through the choices that they are doing. That is the purpose of our counseling, not, not to, you know, question the faith we should never do that in the practice of providing psychosocial support because you know they're they're into so much you know? so this is the first thing that we have to understand do no harm yeah yeah that is the the rule of the thumb okay just have a look just have a look at our experiences uh nina and sis aisha for that um i think similar i we, Similar, since Soraya Sharif Tabao, I think your um, question is all, also answered with with our uh, previous answers. Now, you, the question is, how would you do counseling based on Islamic psychology and someone whose religion is weak? Again, uh, just like what we mentioned, uh, we will yes, we will not um, judge the level of iman of someone. Or if you're saying a person is a non-practicing Muslim, or even if a person is a practicing Muslim, if the person comes to you as a client, you work with whatever the client has uh, with him or her first. You work with that first. Um, because what you want is to unfold, to, to facilitate the unfolding of the, you know, the, because it is the truth. Because Islam, uh, I mean, it is the truth. It it will slowly, you know, inshallah, through the process of um, you know, the therapeutic through the therapeutic process, inshallah, with the you, you know with the guidance of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the person will slowly find his way back to his center or the fitra. However, um, yeah, just remember, we we work with whatever the client has first. In fact, in in our cases in the field, there are people who don't even want to to pray. Asiguro ano? That, that's the most uh, that's the most practical thing to. To give us an example, uh, it's psychological first aid and uh, in individual in group setting. There are things that we cannot say in individual sessions because you have to work with what the client is in 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 at the level the client is in. Uh, but if you are doing group, okay, uh, PFA in the form of psychoeducation, that's the time that you can share. Um, in the form of tips, it's not a uh, it's not a directive. It's not an order. You are. Uh, I'll just give you a a, a sad uh, example. For example, uh, in, in the community when there's a disaster, this is happening to you because uh, you are this community is sinful. No, <laughs> definitely a no no. Okay, this is a, a this is an expiation of sins from Allah. Okay, uh, you have to be patient. Things like that. No, we do not do that. What we do is. We give them tips. These are these are certain things that we might want to do to help us feel better, to help us process our emotions. And then you give the different uh, prophetic ways of dealing with uh, emotions or with the stressors. So general again. Okay. And then I think the last one. Um, okay. Uh, conflict. I, I found this somewhere. I learned. Conflict resolutions and. Um, Okay, applying the um, Islamic the Islamic framework when resolving conflict in the community or the Islamic way of resolving conflict. I mentioned a while ago, uh, Sir Aldis Mark uh, for the question. Malik Musalam. Again, uh, what we're what we're doing is, I, I think in the trainings that I've conducted. Something that's usually missing in the conflict prevention and mediation training would be um, capacitating the responders to the conflict uh, mediators in uh, psychological first aid. Okay, psychological first aid in the Islamic perspective on conflict 
uh, mediation, resolution, prevention. Uh, why am I highlighting here the need to capacitate them um, in MHPSS, particularly PFA? Because when you have a conflict, if there's a conflict already, a, a, a good example, RIDO, okay, or human rights violations, okay? So what you want to do when you go to the to the um, oppressed or the, the the affected family, you you want to help them process how they feel first, okay? Using an Islamic perspective on about how to deal with emotions, things like that, because more often than not, when you have rido or uh, or other conflicts in the community, because of these emotions that are not processed, and then the was was okay whether of the, the shayateen or, or other people who are highly emotional around them, usually the conflict escalates. So what you want your mediators to do first is to come there, not just to get a report, not just to get, it's, it's like a police report, no, not just to get a report of what happened, but also to be there as a brother or as a sister who will help the person process how he or she feels. So for example, what we're saying to human rights workers uh, would be, okay, if you need to get the report, if you think the person can, can uh, give you a report at that moment, tamam, oh, okay, you, you get the report. However, it would be beneficial if you don't just stop with the report. After talking to the person or getting the report from the person, if you are equipped, or if you have someone with you who is equipped to do the PFA, then it would be nice to conduct PFA with the you know, family. Because that's something that helps a lot for them to make sense of how they're feeling, you know, not intellectualizing everything or not suppressing it in the guise that I am a strong Muslim, I am not going to cry or I am not going to, you know. But then a lot of people are giving different, you know, advice to them around them, which is non-Islamic. So um, I think, Suratul um, Hujurat, in, in the recent training, um, I was... Um, for uh, blessed to conduct together with other organizations under Teach Peace Build Peace Movement, um, most of the concepts that we were sharing came from um, from Suratul Hujurat, okay, for conflict prevention and resolution, and then of course the uh, the the uh, may may Allah forgive me, I forgot the ayah where we talk about kasas and um, you know. Yung, um, how we deal with with cases that that um, involve the loss of lives. Okay, so we we get from the Quran and Hadith again. Okay, so uh, again, just like in in natural in the regular counseling or psychosocial processing sessions, um, when when applying this to actual conflicts. Uh, it really depends on the gravity of the situation. It depends on the, you know, the, the state of the people we will be talking with. It depends really on all these things. But what happens is you are there, um, uh, you know, using all this knowledge and experiences that you have to know when and what to say and how to say at that particular moment. I hope that uh, helps, inshallah. Okay, there was a question here. Or there was a um, tips on uh, Islamic healthcare. I think that can be a good next session or or future session for ISIP. Okay, um, I think we were able to cover all of the questions. Inshallah. All right. I think we were able to uh, for. I uh, think we won't be giving the tips on Islamic uh, mental health care right now, okay? But you might want to check the websites, the links that we shared. You also you may want to like the Facebook page, Islamic Mental Health. We're actually giving tips there already through some of our posts, okay? And the uh, islamicmentalhealth.com website as well. So, um, uh, we will give the virtual floor back to Sis Iman. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah for this um, 
wonderful and meaningful night with all our participants and speakers. Jazakallahu khairan to our brothers and sisters. Jazakallahu khairan to our three beloved, beautiful, and very inspiring speakers, Sister Jane, Sister Anna Tejmina, and Sister Aisha. May Allah preserve you and guide you and May, may many more benefit and spread the wisdom that you shared here tonight. So brothers and sisters, this is the conclusion of our launching event, our first virtual talk for ISIP Philippine chapter. It is our honor and privilege to spend this night with you. Uh, I will be posting the participant feedback form in the chat box. Hope that you would answer them so that we could um, do better in our future endeavors, inshallah. With your energy and interest, this gives us hope that there would be more endeavors and activities, initiatives for ISAP Philippines, inshallah. If you have further questions, you may email us in the emails that we provided and you may contact us to our in our social media accounts and you may also receive materials through our WhatsApp groups. Jazakallah again, jazakallah khairan. May we see each other again in the future for more sharing of goodness and knowledge, inshallah. To finally end the program, we will be having the closing prayer by Brother uh, Samur again, inshallah. Brother? I, he will be coming here because, uh, yeah, he lost his signal no on his problem. mobile phone. <laughs> okay. No problem. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يسكون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين تقبل الله جزاكم الله خيرا كثيرا brother. I'm sorry to go back again. Um, if everyone, uh, if anyone is interested or uh, willing, can you turn on your cameras for a quick photo op with the group with Sister Jane as well and Sister Anna Tejmin and Sister Aisha? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. So our dear participants, hope you could turn on your cameras quickly. Kahit nakapambahay po, okay lang. Okay. 